and we might know those things that are going to take place after this, we pray. And Lord, we ask that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for that just beautiful worship. I want to ask Randall to come up. When we were praying for the conference, we really felt like we were to blow the shofar to start the conference. And just as a sign that God is blowing a trumpet, uh, the Lord's voice is like the sound of a trumpet, that the Lord is blowing a trumpet in Zion, and just the, the times we live in are of utmost importance. We, we know that. That's why I'm sure we're here. But just that, that the Lord would sound that trumpet, blow that trumpet in Zion. So, Randall, come on up. I think you're here somewhere. Randall, is he not here? Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. And you can go ahead and turn the lights on because I, I need sunglasses if I don't have you here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do the offering actually after, after uh, Terry speaks. So, yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, yeah, we're going to blow the shofar and then jump right in. So go ahead and just, uh, just, just go ahead and blow the shofar. And Lord, let us really sense as the shofar is being blown, Lord, the, Lord, let us sense in the spirit, Lord, the burden of the Lord, we pray. Lord, tenderize our hearts. Tenderize our hearts, Lord. I pray that we would have a real sensing, Lord, of the urgency of the hour, Lord. Soften our hearts to hear what you want to speak, Lord, and what you want to say. Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm not going to talk too long. I'm going to get Terry to come up here in a second, but just really grateful for everybody being here and just love. I'm sure you're here because you have a heart for God. I'm sure it's not because you have nothing else to do, but we're here because we really, really want to hear what the Lord is speaking and saying. It's a, I just have this sensing that the month of September is a very, very serious time, very urgent time. And I just think that the timing of this conference is very strategic in the fact that it's here at the end of August and heading into September when, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But God has us here, uh, you know, to hear from him. And so, anyway, I just want to go ahead and welcome Terry to come speak. And just so love Terry and so appreciate you and so honored to have you with us. And, yeah, anyway, look forward to what you have to share. I'll set this down here. Well, thank you, guys. It's so good to see everyone. See Bryce and Patricia out there. They're married just recently, right? Congratulations, guys. Bryce, I just want you to know we prayed so long. I say so long, but knowing Patricia since we've known her, we prayed for the right man, and you're the right man. Isn't he, Patricia? Uh, thank you, both. Our family loves Patricia dearly, and just getting to know Bryce more and more, Dearly love you guys. We ought to know that. And my dear brother back here just got married recently as well. So, uh, yeah, it's so, uh, so wonderful. Is your wife here? Yeah, so, is your wife here, brother? Okay, I can't see her. There you are. There. Okay. Well, congratulations, guys. Been a, been a, uh, just a joy to get to know you guys and watch what the Lord is doing. That is awesome. I believe, we were talking about this a little bit earlier today, I believe these weddings are a, a sign of the Lord, not just congregationally, but as to God's timing. We are being prepared 
for a wedding, aren't we? That is the truth. Hey, brother, how are you? Good to see you. It's been a while, hasn't it? Great to see you. Miss Susan, how are you, sweetie? Good to see you. Good to see everybody. It's good to be seen. You know, I thought I would come here and, and talk about the price of eggs in China. <laughs> They're going up, you know. So, I mean, I'm kidding. No, uh, it is a great time to be alive in the Lord. Um, I would say it's a great time to be alive if you're not in the Lord. But if you're in the Lord, uh, I think we can see clear signs that a wedding is approaching. It has been, of course, for quite some time. Now, I'm not looking at evil, even though evil has something to speak. But I'm not really looking at evil when I talk about, oh, it, I know it's the sign uh, that we needed to see to know the Lord is coming is evil. I don't believe that. Not firstly. I think that follows something else. And so uh, for, for me to say, oh, I, I believe the Lord's coming because what I can see going on out there, that's not at all where I'm coming from. Things are going on out there. I'm only, I'll soon be 63. Um, some of you are older and some of you are younger here. Um, but in my almost 63 years of life, there's a lot that is unprecedented that I've not seen before. But that doesn't mean a lot. All I'm saying is evil does not trigger the coming of the Lord. It just doesn't. Readiness triggers the coming of the Lord. So uh, readiness is the key, don't you think? Allowing the Holy Spirit to make us inwardly ready as well as collectively ready, outwardly ready is the key. Evil will follow suit. So I say that as an encouragement. Well, it's really bad. Somebody's getting ready. Hello. <laughs> it's really bad out there. That's because there's a people coming out to the Lord. And that didn't start yesterday. It started back some time ago. It would not be the condition that it is out there if it were not for the fact that there's a people coming out to the Lord. So anyway, uh, glad you are here living in this time, and I'm glad to be living in this time myself. Though if the Lord wants to take me tonight, amen. But that would be on my part an escape. <laughs> I just would like to be with the Lord, wouldn't you? We were meant, in, in this right, Drew, we were not meant for all this nonsense. Isn't that right, brother? We weren't meant for the reign of evil. We were created for the reign of the Lamb. I say let's get to it. <laughs> Don't you guys? Let's go to, get on with it. Go be some darkness, yes, but following this is going to be what God wanted. And what we were created for. So let's get on with it, okay? All right, so I'm going to start in one place tonight and end up somewhere else, as you would know, right? I know it's a poor sense of humor, but it's the only one I have. So bear with me and just think in the millennium, you're going to have to put up with it the entire time. I'm not even saying it's going to get better in the millennium. It may not. I mean, when you start from something so bad, it could be hopeless as far as the humor. But uh, anyway, let's look at a few passages of Scripture uh, tonight. And uh, some of what Brian was saying plays into what I'm desiring to share, at least in this opening tonight. I think I'm sharing three times. I did not want to. I did not want to share one time. <laughs> I'd rather hear others share about Jesus. I love that dynamic. I would be fine with Josiah, Isaac, Brian, Ken, others sharing the Lord and me listening. Appreciate the Lord coming through his own people, all of you. I appreciate the Lord coming through you. I appreciate it tonight, the Lord coming through the team up here, didn't you? It was beautiful. Hello? Wasn't it beautiful? The Lord was coming through. How many have received of the Lord? Just I did. It was awesome. I, I, I thank God for that. I just want you all to know uh, I appreciate the Lord coming through. 
Um, so being able to listen is important to the Lord and the Lord coming through others is important for me. I don't want to be talking all the time. I grew up extraordinarily shy. I'm an introvert. And wouldn't you know that the Lord put me in front of doing this. So he's got a good sense of humor too, the Lord does, right? So let's look at some scripture tonight. We're going to read several things. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 firstly, and then we will move on from there. There is somewhat a hope of cohesiveness to the three messages that I'm going to share. Um, I can say that whether they're focused around the person of Jesus Christ himself, yes. So that's true, but there's other levels of cohesiveness in this that uh, is really what I'm going to be looking at as well. So in Ephesians chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters of the entire Bible. Um, so it's hard for me not to uh, read the whole thing, but let's start with verse 1 and go from there. <clears throat> for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, he's in prison, as you guys know when he's writing this, for the sake of you Gentiles, or you nations, I don't know why they don't translate that rightly, it should be nations. Nations. God's son for all peoples. Aren't you glad? For the sake of the nations, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. Sure, uh, you've noticed this many times, but one more time, take note. The mystery, the mystery. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Christ himself, his very person, a mystery. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. A lot of meaning in the Greek words here. Don't want to get uh, bogged down in them. Uh, the Greek word therefore revealed has meaning that I just, let me just encourage everyone this way, because most of us can do this now on a computer or on our phone. We can look at the meaning of these words, and uh, it would be good to do so. Or you've got a certain Bible that perhaps uh, will do this for you, but um, has now been revealed. There were things that were the mystery, again, of Christ that had not been made known in the past generations. But with the coming of Christ and the apostles and prophets of the Lord, God revealed to the apostles and prophets, Christ, the mystery. Not Jesus of Nazareth, though, yes, he came that way. But his intent was not for them to know Jesus of Nazareth. His intent for them and us was and is to know Christ, the mystery, unveiled inwardly. Part of the meaning of the Greek word here is to unveil, to take the lid off of something, to make it known. There's multiple meanings here. So similar to what we call the book of Revelation, these similar words, very similar. So it's the revelation of a person, and Paul's going at it here as well. So. But the revelation did not come to everyone in mass. The revelation came by divine order and purpose to the apostles and prophets of the New Testament. But, however, for everyone 
who would have ears to hear what the Spirit was saying to the church through these individuals. God still uses us that way, right guys? God speaks through you, right? Speaks through us to others. So <clears throat> that's not a, uh, it's not a matter of, well, I don't like it that God does it. He does it regularly. He's always done this. He makes himself known in that sense. And I think as, you know, I'm not talking about deeply knowing the Lord, but the first time we're able to share with someone about the Lord, the Lord is using us to speak to them about him. I hope, don't you? I want to. I want to be used that way about Jesus. Now, I have to say, guys, I don't invite people to church. I don't ever do that. I invite people to Jesus. I just don't invite them to church. I figure until you know the Lord, let's say it this way, in knowing the Lord, you'll be a part of the church. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't gather. We should. But I'm saying I'm not inviting people to a church. Well, come to our church. It's the best thing. That's not true of the gathering. Come to Jesus. He is the only thing. <laughs> right? Any group of people, the gathering back home there in Tennessee, just a group of people, I love them, they love me, but we're a group of people needing Jesus. So why not get people to the source, right? So I get a chance, as y'all do, to talk to people when the Lord opens the doors of their heart. I don't force it, but when he opens the doors of the, their heart, which is many times different ways in which he does that, I get a chance to share the Lord with them. I've had so many of them living in the South, isn't this true? People, where do you go to church? I won't tell them. Number one, I don't want them to come. <laughs> Why, Terry, don't you want to? Because if they come and hear me speak and they don't know the Lord, they'll never, they'll be so offended. So you got to know the Lord um, or you're just going to get offended. Isn't that true? So first step, know the Lord. So I've had so many of them. Where do you go to church? You pastor? I'm, I'm not a pastor. I once thought I was when I was in the denomination I was in years ago. There was only three things you could be. You were a pi pastor, a missionary, or an evangelist. That's all there was. The rest of the Bible, forget it. <clears throat> and I'm not much into positions anyway. Well, what are you, Terry? I'm Terry. That's what I am. Aren't, aren't you who you are? It's who's in us that matters. Positions, titles, those don't mean anything. Right? Well, you need to call me the reverend. No, you don't. Just call me Terry. <laughs> aren't you whatever? I, I, if you mean scumbag, yes. I'll admit to that one. <laughs> Have a little bit of fun with this. So titles don't mean anything, do they? Anyway, so the problem is today in our age, titles seem to mean something. And I would like to think of it more like this. Whatever God has done in placing the members of his body together, I just want to be in that place where he's placed me. Whatever member of the body that is, but the fullness for it to ever to be what the body needs in fullness is going to be the Lord in that member, the Lord in us, each of us as a member, not just us. So anyway, uh, the Lord reveals himself, and I want to say it just that way. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ, which is a portion, a part of in his giving, being given to us, Right? So I'm just contemplating saying something here. So in the ancient um, Jewish wedding ceremony, so the, uh, the son had seen the woman that he wanted to be his bride. He and his father would write a contract together, a contract which was a covenant. And in that covenant, they would have laid out in the covenant, written covenant contract, everything that 
the bridegroom, the son, was going to be and do for that potential bride that he was looking at. And they would go with three things to the bride and the home of the bride, to her, her father, and if she had a, a brother, they would present the contract, the covenant. It would be read in the presence of her, of her father, and of her brother. The son or the bridegroom would also bring his most valued gift to give to the potential bride. He would give that gift to her, and if she turned him down, it was still her gift, though it was the most costly thing he could give. Guess what that gift was? The Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us. Jesus said so. He told us that he would give us the Holy Spirit, and he said this about it. He said, and he will be with you forever. Forever. Right? So he would, uh, if then she signed the contract, the covenant of marriage, they had a one cup there. She would initiate by taking the cup of wine. She would drink it, and then by her acceptance of the covenant, of marriage, offer it back to the bridegroom who would drink it as well. Jesus said, I will not drink it again to his disciples until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Right? I go to prepare a place for you was the bridegroom and the bridegroom's dead going back to the Father's house. I say that now, it could be a house attached to the Father's house, but John 14, Jesus is emphatically clear, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare, here it is, a bridal chamber for you in my Father's house, meant for her and him. I'm going into this story to illustrate something. So, and he would let her know, I'm going to come again. Now, there was a set time for his coming, and it was midnight. It was a charade in that day. He would actually let her know. Now, she would be required. She has, okay, the gift. We know that to be the Holy Spirit himself. But she was required to keep a lamp burning like in a window so that when he came at night, he could recognize that was her room and she was ready. The lamp was burning and it had fresh oil in it, never old oil, fresh oil that she was responsible for every day to keep it fresh, to keep it burning, lit for his return. Her time had been spent in preparation. Well, spiritually speaking, what preparation? Inward preparation, becoming his kind, inwardly, so that they would be compatible. Right? Part of the contract was that the father and the son had agreed to not only what, what was in the contract as I will provide for you, I will be your source, but I'm going to go back and prepare a place for you. And that was spelled out in the contract as to what it would be. The father then oversaw the contract and oversaw the preparing of the room. And the bridegroom could not return for his bride until that room was exactly as was in the covenantal contract of being prepared. When it had been prepared in exactness, then not the son, but the father would say, go get your bride. So it's up to the father to tell the son when, as bridegroom, to go and get the bride. It was not up to the son to determine that. It was up to the father. That's what Jesus said. I do not know when I'm going to return. The, these times are committed unto the father. That's a bridal covenantal contract being expressed. Right? So he would come back at midnight, call out of his return, be a charade going on. The family knew he was coming. But what I want us to see is the spiritual Im imagery. And he would come. This was actually in the ceremony. He would steal her like a thief away from her home. That's what would happen. 
at midnight. And he would take her to the prepared place that only they too could enter into. Anyway, that's quite beautiful. My point really is though this issue of the Holy Spirit being given to prepare her. And let's look at ourselves for a moment. The Holy Spirit is given to us unto what purpose? Kind. And that what's said to Adam in Genesis, Adam had no one of his kind. He had named all the animals. They all had mates. But Adam did not have his kind. Isn't it great to have a kind, brother? Isn't it great, Bryce? Isn't it great to have your kind, Patricia? Your kind, kind. I hope everyone who's married in the room can say, you're my kind. If your sweetie is right here, just turn up and say, you're my kind. Now, if you don't, it's not a prepared place you're going to tonight. It's the doghouse. <laughs> I'm very familiar with the doghouse myself. <laughs> My sense of humor puts me in the doghouse all the time. But it is the Holy Spirit's work to prepare. So now we're going to go on here, get some more scripture here in Ephesians chapter 3. So, the apostles and prophets are given with a revelation of Christ being made known to them. I say it that way. He has been and he is being made known. It is an ongoing work. That would be true in Revelation 12 of the woman. She is ready to a measure, but she is being made ready fully. She is not fully ready, but she is ready enough to have a supernatural birth like Mary Something birthed entirely of God and not by the will of man, not by the carnal mind, not by the church mind, not by the mind of Christianity. Revelation 12 shows us that there is a vessel going to be birthed on the earth that is of the heart, the will, the mind, of the, and the desire of God eternally. The perfect vessel for the most dark times, but will be the most glorious times of Christ revealed in the earth that there has ever been up to that point. Okay, so, so the church itself can never bring forth what the Lord wants. The Lord will bring forth what he wants from a people though who have come out to him to they have been made ready to a certain point, and they are being made ready. So I just want to say this. So the work then of the apostles and prophets in the revelation of Jesus Christ, along with the Holy Spirit, is this whole idea of readiness, internal and external, both readiness, right? So let's, verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members, or the nations are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given. See, Paul didn't think highly of himself. For him to say, called to be an apostle, wasn't a position. It was a function, not a position. It is clear, is it not, that God has exhibited the apostles as last in the procession, quoting the scripture. Is that not right? Paul says that clearly. They are those condemned to death. So, uh, I think it, of it this way. You say, well, they're all going to die. Not all of them died. But the death of the cross worked in them mightily of necessity. And it's just easier just to die physically than it is to let the cross bring the death of Christ to my self-life and my soul life. Wouldn't you agree, guys? Much easier. Just kill me and get it over with the Lord. No, I've got a better plan, Terry. <laughs> I'm going to drag this out. <laughs> Not in a torture some way. I don't mean it that way. But I prayed a prayer. 
He tricked me into praying the right prayer. I wouldn't have known to pray the right prayer. He tricked me into praying it. I just want you, Jesus. I heard that. <laughs> I'm messing around, but so to speak, God, how many recognize of us tonight that God got us to pray the right prayer without us necessarily knowing what kind of prayer we were praying? And now that we've prayed it, what's coming? Okay, so well, anyway, I got to hurry. All right? I don't know what time it is. Is there a clock anywhere? Eight o'clock, eight o'clock, okay. okay. Oh, seven, seven o'clock our time, that's right, yeah. That's great, thank you. <clears throat> so, let's skip to verse eight. To me, the very least, or we just read some of it, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the nations the unfathomable riches of Christ. We are still to proclaim the unfathomable riches of Christ. The apostles and prophets of the New Testament proclaimed the unfathomable riches of Christ, right? They preached him. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 that they were preaching Christ. He says to the Corinthians, when we read Corinthians, he's proclaiming Christ. Peter is proclaiming Christ. John is proclaiming Christ. The apostles and prophets are preaching the one who's been revealed and is being revealed in them. They are preaching him. Right? So they're preaching the unfathomable riches of Christ and they are, verse 9, bringing to light what is the administration of the mystery. I want you to catch that. Christ has been a mystery. He will remain a mystery except that God has chosen through the apostles and prophets of the New Testament era to begin to, begin, to, begin to bring forth. I'll get it right here in a second. To begin to bring forth the administration of the mystery where the mystery now is being, he is being revealed. He, the mystery, is being revealed. He, the mystery being revealed is so that the next age can come into being. I want us to catch that. Beyond this age, beyond the day of darkness, the time of darkness, beyond what's called the age of evil in your Bible and my Bible, is another age. An age that would, uh, let's say it this way, had man not fallen for man, it would not have been an age of evil. There would still be the putting away of Lucifer and that crowd. But we would have already been into this, what I'm going to term, the final and full ministry of the Lord, who is the unsearchable riches, in an age that would bring, this is Ephesians 4, the knowledge of Christ to the entire universe. And that's the purpose of the bride. The man-child is temporal. The bride is eternal. The man-child is the confrontation of the great darkness. Now, the man-child is a part of the bride. Don't misunderstand me. But the man-child and the power of God and his authority that's going to flow through the man-child in confrontation with the forces of evil on this planet is a temporal ministry of the man-child. But the man-child is a part of a bigger vessel, an eternal vessel, a vessel that man, if man had not fallen, the man-child would never have been necessary. Caught a bride, and it is that bride that God is going to unleash upon the creation who know God is their creator, but do not know his nature. But the bride has him living in her. She is joined to him in life. That doesn't make her God, that makes her a vessel. And the Lord inhabiting her. Let's be clear. This isn't her heresy. Oh, I become like the Lord. That's heretical teaching. That's not true at all. We are nothing without him and will remain nothing without him. He is everything. We are meant to be inhabited. We don't have a boast in this other than the Lord. Is that not right? We're not boasting in our righteousness because ours is filthy rags. 
There's an entire universe out there that's waiting for the coming of the bride because God has promised through angels her coming. Don't you think it's time we get on with it? That the knowledge of Christ fill the entire universe? Ephesians chapter 4. Don't you grow weary of being stuck in the day of evil? All that is true. What's the answer? Readiness. That's the answer. The Lord would have already come had he had a people who made himself ready. He has wanted to come for the past 2,000 years. It has been the delay of his people, not ready. Anyway, let's move on. That sounds negative. I, I don't mean it to just sound negative. The positive is, is, guys, we have an invitation of the Lord himself. We don't have to see delay anymore. How about this, Drew? Let us hasten the day. What do you think about that, brother? Is that not good? How many give a thumbs up? Looking for and hastening. And if that's not possible, why is it written? How do you hasten? Readiness. That's how you hasten it. It has been the lack of readiness that's brought the delay, and it will be readiness that brings the hastening. I'd like to go to the fast track right now, wouldn't you? All right, Lord. All right, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm going to quit resisting you, Holy Spirit. I want you to really inwardly fill me with the Lord and deal with the power of my uncontrollable soul. How about that prayer? That's a good prayer, huh? I want you to go deep, not shallow. I don't want to be a shallow anything, right? So, anyway, we are not even got to the scripture I'm supposed to read yet, isn't that? <laughs> so this is what happens when I read lengthy passages like this. But the Lord would have already had us through the millennium. Had there not been delay, the millennium would have already occurred. And most of the people on the earth would have been born in the millennium rather than what we've seen over the last couple of thousand years. What a difference it would make to have a lamb reigning in Jerusalem and instead of the government of evil that we have all lived under. God's will was not for it to last this long. God's will was not for so many to go to hell. It has been the delay, the delay that has caused these things. And it's not God delaying. The best evangelism we can do is get to the millennium where over 10 billion people will be born and not under the government of evil. Don't you think? At best, guys, I'm, I'm sorry to have to say it this way, but you know the truth of it. At best, how many do we see every 100 years? How many do we see? Go to hell versus find the Lord. And it's getting worse, not better. Well, that's not really the message, but it's a good one nonetheless. God has gotten blamed for so many things that was never his will. So, well, if it's not his will, why can't he stop it? He would have to stop us to do it and start all over again. We're the evil. You are the evil that he's up against, and so am I. Let's hit this. Oh, that evil out there. It's you and me. What's in us when Christ is not there? You're evil. Christ is the end of it. Thank God. I'm evil. Christ was the end of it. Can we say amen to that? 
Otherwise, it's random out there. Well, it's just that evil out there. That would be us. Why doesn't he just stop evil? You mean kill you? <laughs> Seriously. So God's getting blamed for things that is not his fault. Never was his fault. Never has been his fault. He's being discolored and stained in his very nature. His loving nature, his merciful nature, his kind nature has been stained because of the church. That's what is said to Israel. Because of you, my name is being blasphemed among the nations. That's what he said to Israel. Can he say the same thing to the church now? Anyway, that's intense. Okay, calm down, Terry, calm down. All I can say, can't, we can all say this. I said this to the Lord recently. If you're not going to come in this generation, do not let it be because I'm the delay. That I can deal with. He wants to come. He's wanted to come. That's not new. What's new is that there's a people who are coming out to him and in numbers that have never been seen before. But it's not just numbers, guys. It's the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's the measurement. That's the readiness key. Not just numbers but the measure of the stature. Amen? All right, let's go on. So, bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. I like that wording, don't you, Brian and Ken? Don't you guys like that wording? Bring to light. Isn't it time, John, that we bring to light? We bring to light. Bring Christ the mystery to light. This is the time of the Lord. Think about it. This is the time of the Lord and his mercy, his grace, his newness of life, Scott and Kathy. Everything we were ever promised is in this person in whom are the unfathomable riches of the Godhead. Isn't that beautiful? I got to get excited when I talk about Jesus. Who is he? We're not talking about, oh, yeah, Jesus is okay, but I can't wait to get to heaven so I can do all the good things of heaven. Heaven's not your reward. Christ is. Is that not? He's our exceeding great reward. It's what the Lord said to the first priesthood. You guys can't have any land, Levites. You can't have that. I will be your reward. Isn't that what we want? And I've got some land, but you've got to pay taxes on it. <laughs> It was meant to be a joke. I mean, it's the truth, but that's, is it really ours? You don't pay taxes and you don't keep it. So not only, sorry, but not only do you have to buy it up and upkeep it and take care of it and do everything, but you got somebody handing, oh, you got to pay me rent on. <laughs> there's something wrong with that. Y'all know that? Anyway, forget that. I hope there's no tax people in the room. <laughs> I don't care. I, if, I'd be more likely to say it if you were in the room. Get another job. Get a real living. <laughs> Why don't you make an honest dollar? <laughs> That's the way we used to say it in the old days as surveyors. We'd pull over to other surveyors working for the state. Be four of them out there while one guy was doing all the work. When are you guys going to make an honest living? <laughs> Sorry. I'm mean, aren't I? I don't try to be mean. It's just, okay, I come from a civil engineering survey. We had our own business doing it. So, I mean, I'm out there chopping through the woods, fighting everything known to man, ticks, chiggers, wasps, hornets, getting hornet's nests appear right in front of you in the summer after you trot down the tree, there's a hornet's nest. It's not fun to come face to face with a hornet's nest. Anyway, so we're out there doing that, and I have people say, oh, you are the guys out there on the road. No, not us. If we're ever on the road, they're trying to run us over. How did I go down that path? Anyway, so such is life. Good, honest work is good for a man, don't you think? Anyway, I had a hearty welcome on that, hearty amen on that. Good, honest work is good for a man. It's a part of your curse. You might as well get on with it. <laughs> the sweat of your brow. <laughs> All right, I'm having fun, but anyway, let's go on. So, the, the administration of the mystery being brought to light, Christ being revealed first to the vessel 
for which God will reveal himself to the rest of the universe. First comes the vessel. First comes the bride. Then to the rest of the universe. To reveal himself to a creation, he who is the invisible God, he who dwells in unapproachable light, to reveal himself to a creation, created beings. There's only one way to do that. He must inhabit a created being. You. So that the bride shows the creation something about the bridegroom. His nature. He lives in her. He is her life. He shines in and through her to the rest of the creation. Because the creator is known, the nature of the creator is not known. And it's one thing to know someone who has all this power. It's another thing to know what he's like inwardly, intimately, that he's a father, that he can be known, that he loves that he is merciful, that he is kind, that he is caring, that he is gentle. Right? What is called in the Bible his invisible attributes. That made known. So, I don't have any notes on this, so, you know, I'm just looking at the scriptures here. But I'm just saying this, guys. He wants to be known. He wants us to know him so that he can make himself known. This is the administration of the mystery in operation. Paul says it this way in Philippians, I want to know him. There's divine purpose in that, divine intent in that. Personally, individually, yes, and eternally to the entire universe. Let's go forward. <clears throat> in order, verse 10, in order that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known. See? Through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenlies. Places is not there in the Greek. Just heavenlies. Not heaven. Heavenlies. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the heaven lease. To who? The rulers and the authorities. It's not talking about humans. Not in the heavenlies, it's not. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he is inaugurated, has he not? A new, a living way in his flesh. He has brought an order now back to purpose. From chaos from death, from darkness, from destruction, Christ, the person, has brought order, divine order. He has brought forth now divine purpose. He has brought forth divine intent. But not into, sorry to say it this way, but bear with me, but not into an ignorant church. A self, sorry, but y'all understand what I'm saying? A self-engrossed church. We are meant for him. We were created for him, right? Colossians chapter 1. He made us for him. Why do you exist? You were made by the Lord to be his dwelling place. For the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, to come into us, to indwell us, and to reveal himself in us, to us, in an incredible relationship of union of life, his life. And through us, though, to shine and show himself to the entire creation. 
got to get a drink. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of reasons to not want delay. To see evil gone, amen. But there's more, there's more than that. <clears throat> it is possible to want to know this and that about the book of Daniel and what Paul writes <clears throat> concerning the end and what Peter writes concerning the end. And to want to know about the book of Revelation and miss the point, the person. That the cause of delay is this lack of oneness of life, readiness, union, God having his bride in that ready place, inhabiting her and her in full alignment. Isn't that true? My interest is not in simply knowing all the ins and outs of what's coming. I want to know him. And I will not be ready for what's coming if I don't. Knowing what's coming does not make me ready. Knowing the Lord makes me ready. It's not that we have to stay in ignorance, but first things first is my point. First things first. The only reason we're in the book of Revelation now, chapter 5, the seals have not been broken yet that I've seen. We're in Revelation 5 where the book's been offered and the Lord's taken the book in his hand. But the seal, first seal has not been broken. And the rider of the white horse has not yet been leashed, loosed. By the way, I got a little white horse on my shirt here. That's what well, that is. I thought, I thought it was fitting. <laughs> Considering the rocky terrain, I thought I would, you know, that's just <laughs> so readiness intimacy we have him to give we have him to share with one another first things first with this earth then with the universe <clears throat> so the manifold wisdom of God might now now let's bring it don't you think? Now. Everybody in agreement? How about now? No more delay. How about now? How about, and I'm saying not now at the return of the Lord. I'm saying now, that'll come, but if we have this first. Now, the administration of the mystery come to full measuredness. Christ in a people, in full measure. It is clear that it is the full measured people who causes him in divine order to break the first seal. It is not how evil evil is. It's how ready she is. He's breaking the seal, not Satan. Satan is not allowed to inaugurate the plan he's wanted on this planet ever since he was on this planet. He is being restrained and that by the Godhead until God has what he wants. A bride in a state of readiness that can birth the man child and a bride who will go on to full readiness and until that vessel is presented then evil cannot have its full purposed plan. And so Satan has tried to do this repeatedly throughout history, inaugurate his final plan. And God has resisted him, restrained him over and over and over. He has had to because there was not a people ready. A 
Okay, so again, you can see it there in Revelation 5, Revelation 6, moving forward. It is this truth. It is the Lord himself who breaks the seals and allows evil to go forward. To a measure, let's say it this way, to the full harvest of evil. A full measured harvest of evil that's been being restrained until the Lord breaks the seal. But only after the woman has been made ready to the point that she can birth the man child. God can actually bring that vessel forth by his spirit. So then the passage there, you know, and I talked about this historically, you know, the son, the bridegroom would return, the call would go out at midnight, the bridegroom has come. So I like the parables, doesn't it? Because it is. Behold, the bridegroom has come. He would steal her away, take her back to his father's house and to the room prepared for her, the place prepared for her, the bridal chamber. They would stay there seven days in that bridal chamber. I believe that correlates directly to the seven years or the seven week, the one week or of years that Daniel spoke of. But she's pregnant before she ever goes to the bridal chamber. Because the Lord himself has done the miraculous once again and has brought forth from her his will by his spirit. He has birthed the vessel that man can't get the credit for. Can you say amen to that? Man has no bragging rights on it. She got ready in the Lord birth. I believe it's like you can see in Isaiah 66, verse number 7, and going, who's ever even heard of such a thing? You go on from chapter 7 to the end, can a nation be born in one hour? Well, can a man-child be born in one hour? It'll be a fast work on that man-child. You better believe that. Quick work. Anyway. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. See, God's moving. We see this in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, I believe this. The book of Revelation is to the New Testament what the Song of Songs is to the Old Testament. The book of Revelation is a bridal book, the entirety of it. It is God achieving what he wants, a vessel through which he can show himself, join himself to, and show himself to the rest of the creation. The book of Revelation is showing that. If we read it in that light, then we understand this is that time frame when God gets what he wants. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the singing going on in the book of Revelation. Look at it in chapter 5, all the songs. There's others. So prevalent is the singing, Drew. Isn't this interesting? Even hell is singing. The people, not the demons, but the people in hell are singing of the worthiness of the Lamb to open the book. Go read it. The Greek word there is Hades. People under the earth, Hades, are singing. He's worthy to take the book and open it. The angels are singing it. The elders are singing it. Compare that to the Song of Songs. Her praise of him. No one compares to him. Anyway, see what's going on? Look at chapter 12. Tell me that's not a bridal passage. You got the woman. You got the birthing. You got Satan cast down out of heaven. Because according to chapter 11 of of Revelation, uh, You have these witnesses who have not come out of the outer court. They're not in an outer court relationship. They were only allowed, the the messenger there was only allowed to measure the holy of holy in the holy places, which is where the messenger comes from or the witnesses come from. 
Witnesses come from the, it is a holy place and most holy place relationship. That's where the man child comes out of, not out of the outer court, not out of any mixture. You know, I have to say this, I was a surveyor, right? So I understand the, what's going on there in chapter 11 with the rod. He's given a reed or a rod to go measure the holy of holies in the most, the, the most holy place in the holy place. Well, in the old days, I don't know if there's other people old enough to remember this, but I remember. So they had a 16 and a foot and a half foot long rod, wooden rod. And they would go through the, this is terrible, you know, when you're going up and down hills and things or mountains, but they would go end over end with that rod, and that's how they would measure surveying. I've pulled deeds that, you know, had whatever, 247 rods to a sycamore tree. When you're dealing with a deed that's 300 years old, the sycamore tree is more than likely not there anymore. But I'm familiar with take the rod and measure. In fact, they would have it marked even closer than that. There would be marks on the rod to measure. So they're measuring the holy place and the most holy place. That's where the witnesses are going to come from. It's where the man child's going to come from. It shows something about the relationship that the woman has with the Lord. Right? Just touching on this. When Paul's talking here in chapter 3, what does Ephesians 3 have to do with any of this? It has everything to do with it. Revelation is, the, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the mystery himself. And if we miss that point of the book of Revelation, we've missed the entire meaning. Because that book is showing him in all the, and I say all, at least a small portion of the aspects of who he is. As it said in John chapter 5, and he said this, the Father has committed all judgment unto my hands. Tell me that's not true in the book of Revelation. It's the Lord who looses the seals, the trumpets, the bowls. That's just one aspect. You see him in a measure of fullness there. But take all of the book of Revelation and see Christ. And that's the Holy Spirit. Show me the Lord in this. Not the Antichrist first. Show me the Lord. Right? Let me see him. Let me behold him. Let me know him. I refuse to read any book of the Bible to where I'm not asking the Holy Spirit to show me Christ. Because Jesus said of the 39 books of the Old Testament, these scriptures speak of me. They testify of me. The Holy Spirit who had them inspired was talking about Jesus. So the so same thing is true in the book of Revelation. It is a, a beautiful, wonderful declaration of the absolute, the awe and the majesty and the glory and the power and the absolute authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on and on and on in specific points as to who he is. And I can read the book and see all these things and miss the person. And so chapter 1, verse number 1, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. I want the Holy Spirit to let me see that in every book of the Bible. Right? So we're dealing with eternal purpose here then, Paul, and we're seeing purpose summed up as pertains to humanity in the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, at the last trump, which entails the bowl judgments, the seventh bowl judgment. It entails everything to the end of the millennium and then going into the new heaven and the new earth, all contained in the last trump. We're seeing then this great transition from an evil age to the absolute forever and ever dominant reign of the Lamb, who's also the Lion, to where there's only righteousness and no darkness. Amen? So, Eternal purpose then, which he carried out in Christ Jesus. 
in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart in my tribulations on your behalf. Now, let me get to something here. We're going to take a little bit of a different look at this tomorrow evening. My interest then, I said this at the conference, the summer conference, which was basically talking about that we might be able to stand or that we might stand. A lot of things can be said about the times we're living in and what are we looking for and what do you expect, Terry? Great sweeping moves of God, and I'm not saying nothing like that's going to happen with what I'm about to say. But I am going to say this to us. It's going to be everything of the Lord in us to keep us standing in the days ahead. That we might stand. Great sweeping moves of God that doesn't in inwardly, deeply, Michael, you know what I'm saying? Inwardly, deeply establish Christ in me will not have me standing in the difficulty of these last days. So we get to chapter 3, verse 14, to a wonderful prayer here. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner or inward man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, in the love of God, guys, first and foremost. His love in us and us loving him back. Thus, his love in and through us to one another. It's critical that we understand what's being said here in that light. And I'll say more about it in just a second. We may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And to know the love of Christ, Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. So much in those verses that I'm not going to get to right now. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us. It's the inward, the inward This is not saying, oh, there's nothing outward needing to be done. That's not what my point is here. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, to stand must, there must be inward reality, inward relational reality, inward union. Christ our strength, not my human strength. I will not stand in the days of head, ahead because of my human strength. Right? The strength of the Lord's people will need to be the inward life of the Lord himself. But established, established. Not just a little dab, but the Lord established in his people. The strength of the gift that the bridegroom has given, the strength of the Holy Spirit in the inward man. There's been that dealing of the Holy Spirit with that bridal vessel to where she no longer lives, but is an entirely different life, right? Living in her now. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
We're not going to stand because of our convictions alone. We're not going to stand because we have human strength. We will not stand because we have our doctrines right. None of those outward things will make us stand. It's not that that shouldn't be the case. I'm saying you got to be a weak, wimp, weak, weak wimp. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this, that none of those natural traits None of the natural abilities, our intellectual prowess as pertains to the scriptures, as pertains to knowing about, the God, about God is not going to help us. We're going to have to know the Lord. We're going to have to be possessed of the Lord. We're going to have to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? A people that is God's possession inwardly, outwardly, both. Right at the very center of our being must be that that's deeper than our soul strength, deeper than our natural strength, deeper than our reason and reasoning, deeper than our emotions and our feelings, deeper than that which comprises what we would call the more outward man rather than the man of the spirit. And the spirit of God joined to our spirit, conquering our souls and subduing our souls and lording and reigning over our souls and our outward flesh. They're deeper than all that of the soul and of the natural body, the Lord inwardly as the rock, as the foundation, as the truth that he is, the way that he is, the life that he is. That's what's going to keep us. He as that will keep us. Stable when the Holy Spirit is attacking us and saying, where's God now in this circumstance? Look, you're losing everything. You're going to prison, if that be the case. You're going to die. Where is your God? It will not be the strength of human might and flesh that will keep us there. It will be the inward strength of God. I'm telling you that we are going to be an embattled people in this time. Satan will see to it. But God will prove if we allow, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And it will be greater is he that's within. Within. Right? We will not be able to stand up against the situations that we're going to face and stand in the middle of confusion and chaos and darkness, Scott, when we can't tell what the Lord's doing. We can't tell what our brother and sisters are doing. We can't tell what's going on. But nevertheless, having done everything to stand because of the Lord, right, in us, we stand, therefore, not by human strength, but by he who's greater within us. That's the true nature of spirituality, my friends. The true nature of spirituality is not the outward experiencing of all the things, not that I'm against that. I thank God that we can experience him in every way we can experience him. I thank God that he's our healer, don't you? I think he wants to be that this weekend among us. I do. I'm going to pray about that a moment. I think there's people here who have hearing problems, problems with your ears, your hearing, and the Lord aims to heal this weekend. So I'm not saying I'm against something. I'm not at all against it. But God can heal my hearing and me still have my own human strength, my own energy, my own willpower, thinking I'm going to stand. And human willpower will not get the job done will not overcome the enemy. There is one that has overcome the enemy, Christ himself. So the true nature of spirituality is in this arena of the greatness of Christ established within. Him as foundation. Him as the inward life rock. Him established as inward foundation, inward life rock, 
Let me say it this way. Him is that in us makes us an unshakable people. And nothing else will. And according to Hebrews 12, everything that can be shaken will be shaken again. The church will be shaken. Judaism was shaken right down to its core. The temple destroyed. They had lost God in the midst of their religion. And I fear for the church now that we have lost Christ in the middle of the church and in the middle of Christianity. We have lost the person. It will not be the power of the intellectuals that is going to win this battle for them, nor will it be the power of emotion, the power of moods, which are so flighty. Wouldn't you say? I woke up in a good mood this morning. I'd bet tomorrow you won't. I don't mean that bad. I'm just saying we all are living, aren't we? Everybody in here is alive, right? So how many, don't raise your hands, but how many understand there's days that just are not nice days? There are difficult days. There's good days. There's bad days. <clears throat> God's not trying to change the day. His desire is to establish himself in me. So matter, no matter what the day is, it's he that's the same not the day. He is the strength of our life. Greater is he that's within, within me, than what's in this day. We will not be able to stand, and we've seen this already in our own times, many who could not stand, is that's not true, sad, but true, Many who left the faith because they did not get what they wanted or what they thought they wanted or get, did, you did not give them what they wanted or they came in and they had false promises given to them that Jesus is going to make your life wonderful. And if you're talking about inwardly, I'll agree with that. But if you're talking about outwardly, that's not the promise he's given us. Right? Not in this life. He's promised us inward eternal life. He's promised us a joy that's within. He's promised to be in us greater than what's in this world, not change the world so that we can live in it and function in it with nothing bad going to happen to me today. And people get angry about that, do they not? Well, I, you know, Jesus isn't doing it for me. What is it that he's not doing? Anyway, there are going to be a people in Christianity that are going to become, and this is already happening, perplexed. They're going to be bewildered. They're going to be argued out of their theological position. They're going to be argued out of their intellectual understanding. They're going to be argued down. They're going to believe that they have followed a wrong course in this Jesus. That they've been met, led astray, misled by coming to Jesus. All because their soul is listening. They have ears not un, that are untrained. And they hear their soul screaming, owie. <laughs> I got grandbabies, so they get owies. <laughs> so they hear, <laughs> they hear their soul crying out in pain and not understanding spiritual dynamics because the soul does not, nor will it ever, understand spiritual dynamics. It is the spirit of man that God has joined himself to by spirit. The soul has to be conquered, brought under his control fully. The soul is the wrong organ for understanding spiritual stimuli. It is the right organ for understanding outward stimuli but not spiritual stimuli. 
I'm saying the soul will never understand God. It was not made to do so. The soul will misinterpret God. The soul looks at the natural and says, well, if God was on the throne and loved me, that wouldn't be going on. That is the soul talking. Man's spirit where God joins himself to understands the Lord's still right here with me. He hasn't gone anywhere. Yes, it's bad. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, I may lose everything. I may even lose my life. Nevertheless, this is the Lord in the inward joined to the inward man. Nevertheless. How many instances has this been true? They sang right in the middle of such conditions. Paul and Silas in a prison, having been beaten, singing. Now, that's not anything natural going on, God. Oh, that's their great willpower. It is not. It is the possession issue. <laughs> Isn't that true? I, now, I'm not going to go sign up to be thrown in prison and get beat before we get in there or beat while I'm in there. But if it happens, what will keep us is the same God that keeps us in the good times. The Lord, he says, I am the Lord. I do not change. Everything else changes, right? We're meant to be transformed. Everybody's changing but God. Amen. That's good news, don't you think? We can have a confidence, but not self-confidence. We can trust him. And my, how that's going to be tried in the days ahead. The world is going to be in chaos. You think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. All these are saying, oh, it's going to get better and better. Well, that we see now, how many can see now that was a lie? <laughs> Sorry. That, that was a terrible response. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Anybody listening to the news? <laughs> I don't blame you. They don't tell the truth. <laughs> It's the Lord we trust. Satan is going to twist, and he already has been doing it, Christianity, to the soul. Focused on the outward. And when the foundations of the soul are shaken, what can man do? Move their trust over to a better system, a better man. And Satan is going to bring forth that man. He will fix. He will solve. He will produce. He will share at least a small measure. He will not demand that you bow down and worship him. He will demand that you give allegiance. and That allegiance will be through a mark through a vaccine. Through the pharmacia. Allegiance. Instead of trusting God, trust that I can protect you with this. Is this too straightforward? It's right out of the scriptures. I'm not preaching anything false here. Preaching Revelation chapter 18. And by the pharmacia, their sorcery, they diluted the entire world. The pharmacia. The pharmaceutical industry. The sorcery. Well, take a break. Delusion, strong delusion is coming. It has been prophesied that it would be the case. Strong delusion. So I'm going to give you, what time is it now, guys? Oh, almost 9 o'clock? Man, I'm, I'm moving right along here. I'm going to give you one other thing. I want you to ponder. I want you to ask the Lord. I already know what it means. I'm just saying you may want to consider it. Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1 and 2. <clears throat> if we're waiting for something, we're waiting for the unsealing of the scroll. And when it's unsealed, I want us to see something. And I want to couple this to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, there is this lie that is going forth. 
Jesus warned about it in Matthew chapter 24. See to it that no one deceives you. Amen? You with me? See to it that no one deceives you. Paul warns about it that there will be a lie and that those who believe the lie that God will give them over to strong delusion. Revelation chapter 18, Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 21. The Greek word sorcery and sorcerer comes into play. All of that is the Greek words that we arrive at our pharmacy, pharmaceuticals. Sorry. I don't know what you know about John D. Rockefeller, but if I were you, I would go study that man, how he introduced wickedness and evil. Right? Along with Carnegie. And began to produce petroleum-based medicines. Because he wasn't making enough money off of standard oil. And so he first used it in cosmetics for women's face. Then he used it in perfumes, but he still wasn't making enough. So he introduced it into medicines. They got away from natural remedies, home remedies. This is the early 1900s and went to using petroleum-based medicines for greed purposes, to make more money. This is historical fact. Read it. Now, our entire medical pharmaceutical industry is based off of this. And for a while, if you were a doctor still using the natural remedies, they put you in a concentration camp in this nation. That's how much power Rockefeller had. He had to go to their schools and learn their medicine. I believe in doctors. I got great friends that are doctors. But guys, I want to say something to you. We're going to have to know the Lord as the healer. We're going to have to have discernment. Right? There's a lot more I could say about this, but it needs to be said. But I'm just saying to you, because I'm saying things right now that perhaps you've never heard. Some of you have, some of you haven't, depending on who I'm dealing with out here right now. Read it for yourself. It is eye-opening to read, and I encourage you to do so. If you're not afraid and you want to know the truth, read it. Rockefeller was an evil man, a greedy man. He wanted money. He wasn't making enough off his petroleum. And the medical, the pharmaceutical, became his great money maker, his greatest. So, Revelation chapter 6. The Lord breaks the first seal, which I do not believe has been broken yet. And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as in a voice of thunder, come. Verse 2, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. That's not the correct translation. He went out overcoming and to overcome. That's the correct translation. And I want us to look at a specific word here in verse 2. It's called bow. It is the Greek word toxin, poison. That's how he goes out to conquer. I want you to digest that for a minute. That Greek word T-O-X-O-N became synonymous with poison arrows. That's why it was called poison. I'm sorry. Somebody's got to say something. I aim to. Why would I say it? To condemn? Not at all. To save lives. I ask us, do we trust the Lord? What agenda do I have in telling you what I'm telling you? To condemn you? It is not. To save your life? It is. Now, they cut us off of YouTube because of me telling the truth. I'm talking about an encounter I had in 1996 where the Lord came to me and talked to me about the future and that there would be vaccines brought 
that the FDA, he said, had not properly tested, not approved. And those vaccines would kill more people, he said, than those who died of the illness. That's 1996. The rider of the white horse goes forth with poison to conquer, conquering and to conquer. So he is conquering people with his poison and attempting to conquer people with his poison. Again, you trace the history of this Greek word, it comes into English as T-O-X-I-N, meaning poison. Latin, Greek. And T-O-X-O-N becomes synonymous with poison. Again, because of poison-tipped arrows. And is it proper to say that it means bow? Yes, but what good is a bow without arrows? And thus, the bow became synonymous with poison. Just trace the history. I have. You can do it yourself, and I encourage you to do so. You better understand what is coming. There is something much worse coming than what we've already seen. I do not believe it's long in coming, though I'm not setting dates to that. He will break this, the Lord will break the seal, not the pharmaceutical industry. The worst cannot be permitted until the Lord allows it. This is why I spent so much time tonight talking about knowing the Lord, knowing that which is true versus the counterfeit, having a trained ear versus fear, being able to hear the Lord speak to us rather than many voices, including our own voice the voice of our government, the voice of even pastors and church leaders. We need to hear the voice of the Lord and we need to be led by the voice of the Lord. The rider of the white horse is not Christ, it is the Antichrist. And if you couple this to 2 Thessalonians, you will see that he's been restrained until that which is taken out of the way, which is the Godhead restraining him until the bride is made ready. Then the Lord allows the seals to be broken. Then he can play out his final evil plan on this earth because God will finish it with a bride that is ready. But not before. It is the Lord who's holding the authority, not Satan. It is in the Lord's power, in the Lord's power holding him back. So 2 Thessalonians, then he will be made known. Here it is, chapter 6, verse number 2. What does he do? He uses poison to go forth, conquering again, overcoming, and to overcome. It is amazing to me in Revelation chapter 12 that it is said that the woman and the man-child overcome him. And they overcome him by the blood of the lamb. Is that not right? And the word of their testimony, and by not loving their lives unto death. It is a showdown to the seven churches. He that overcomes. Who? This one trying to overcome them. He tries to overcome. Now you say, well, it's got to be more than just natural poison. It'll be poison on every level. Hear what I'm saying. The delusion, the verbal delusion, the fear that ensues so that men's hearts fail them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. That's what I was talking about. All of this that is coming, it is not our own strength that will keep us. It is not our willpower. It is not our intellect. It is a possession issue. And I challenge us in the room tonight, if we're not in that place of right relationship, quit deceiving ourselves and get to Christ. Quit being a deceiver. 
Don't deceive yourself and don't deceive others. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. You may be deceive some of the people. You won't deceive all of the people. And you will never, and I will never deceive the Lord. There's no way I can stand up here with the times we're living in and not say to us, guys, if ever there was a time for readiness, now is it. If ever there was a need to have the Lord anoint our right ear as he did the priesthood of the Old Testament, to have that ear attuned to him above our voice and the voice of others, it's right now. To have a trained ear, ask him for it. Train my ear to hear you, Lord. He wants his sheep to know his voice. Is that not true? God, help us. Please hear my plea. God, help us not to believe the lies of politicians. And people, if you search out their background, are evil people over people who have the word of the Lord and are trying to save our life. Our government wouldn't do that. You're kidding yourself if you believe that. That's strong language, isn't it? It's the absolute truth. God, I'm not giving you a sermon. I've had the Lord stand directly in front of me multiple times. I'm not talking about a vision and I'm not talking about a dream. What I'm telling you is coming straight from the Lord. We have got to have ears to hear it. Well, I took it, but the Lord will heal me. Maybe, maybe not. I hope we don't act that way towards the mark of the beast. I'm glad this is be this being live streamed. Are y'all on uh, YouTube? You won't be after this. <laughs> they took us down and we got out of it. Because they don't want the truth out there. But it's all getting exposed anyway, guys. If you keep up with anything, Fauci's retiring. You guys know that, right? He's getting out before he gets, it ain't going to save him. Because it's the Lord going to expose. There was an ancient principality who lived in Egypt. That principality went right up against Moses and Aaron. Remember? when he came before the Pharaoh. And that principality's witnesses threw down their rods and they became serpents. And that principality, guys, was the principality of health and healing. That's who it was. And that very principality, different name but same principality, was then had an open door into the Grecian culture. Then the Roman culture. We're not dealing just with flesh and blood here. We're not just fighting that battle. I can't tell you how many people I've prayed for who had COVID, Josiah and I, my wife. Every single one of them had a demon trying to kill them. Every one of them. Not a few, all of them. I have never seen anything like it. I could get more specific, but I don't know that you want to hear it. I'm not just throwing this stuff out there. We have been in the battle for people's lives. We still are. Perhaps you as well. I hope so. I do not believe liars. And we're going to have to know the difference. And I will not believe a lie. And by God, be turned over to strong delusion because I did. And the rider of this white horse come forth and delude and deceive me into the poison.
It opens up a can of worms, but will that then be a part? Yes. Guys, it is, real worship is an allegiance, not just bowing down to an idol, which you wouldn't do. But the worship that the Bible is talking about is to align ourselves with the government of evil, the government of Antichrist, the replacement of Christ. Rather than trust in the Lord, we trust in the government. We trust in them to care for us. We trust in them to provide everything for us and their health. Da 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 da. Now, if this don't get you kicked off of YouTube, let me say some more things. <laughs> YouTube will be held accountable. You, they will have blood on their hands. I do not say that in vengeance. I say that in truth, hoping that some of the people in that company will get out of it and abandon it. It will be judged, as will everything else in the media. The lies are already coming out, and the lawsuits are already going on. My point, though, is not all that stuff. The real solution, my friends, to this rider of the white horse not deceiving us is in a living, internal, that means inward relationship, meaningful real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a disciplined relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I seem to hate that word these days, discipline, right? A disciplined relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean in the prioritizing of him on a daily basis. To not be disciplined in that is to not have a relationship. Hello? Hello? Consistency is a must. God is offering something to us tonight. I'm going to take a moment right here. To get off the roller coaster ride. To come and allow the Holy Spirit to bring to us living inward relationship, consistent relationship, disciplined relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Not coming to get a drink every Sunday or not coming to get a drink every whenever occasion, but to come to know the Lord. I know this isn't the first time y'all have heard that. I'm not saying, but I'm saying there's people here that don't go to this church. Whether you do or don't, it doesn't really matter. For myself, for all of us in this room, this is no time to be floundering. It's no time, my friends. I do not want, God does not want, I'd say a we do not want delay anymore. Is that not right, Rand Randall? We want the Lord, and we want him to possess, and we want him inwardly greater than what we're going to face. And we want to sow that into our marriages, sow that into our children, and sow that into our grandchildren. And are they not worth it to see it and not just be told something? Right? Now is the time. Now is the hour. Such is, you say, well, it won't be a big deal. It's not that things don't come time, sometimes subtle. But what happens here in Revelation chapter 6 will be quick. You will watch it. It will be quick succession. It will be the white horse first followed by war as they try to enforce their will upon populations in the world. And it causes war. Red horse. Coupled with that, and war actually causes this. But that's not all the cause of it. There's devious plans of work that are working, right? It wants to steal, kill, and destroy. In what way? In every way. Steal your food. Make you eat bugs while they eat beef. I hope you don't think that's funny because that's exactly where it's headed. 
Sounds like a conspiracy. Satan is a conspirator. Read Ezekiel. Anyway, that stuff can just cause fear. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said that part, but it's the truth. We gave up our own food production to people who do not care whether you live or die. They care about money. And if we were wise, we would build out of this by taking back under our own power farms, <laughs> growing our own food, raising our own livestock again. Not everybody can do that, but those who can, should. I'm not one much on one to say, oh, they're going to take it all over if we sit by and do nothing. But we don't have to sit by and do nothing. So I used to travel around for years to what was called Joseph International, talking to wealthy people around the world about this very thing. Where they're taking opens up opportunity. There's now an opportunity to take back what we should have never given up. Anyway, let's uh, go a little further. So war will follow. They will push this poison and it will bring war. The dynamic of chapter 6, verse number 2 is clear. This rider of the white horse goes forth to overcome. Overcoming and to overcome, both. Some would say conquering and to conquer, but again, it is overcoming. Satan is going to enforce through delusion, through fear, through lies upon the world his poison, verbal poison, pharmaceutical poison, all types of poison in the foods, in the water. That really, that's nothing new. War is going to come out of it. There'll be a lot of reasons for wars. There'll be many wars, not just one. But there will be a world war as well. There will be a red horse that will take peace from the earth. That people should kill one another. A great sword was given to that rider to bring that war. When he broke the third seal, famine, shortages, high prices, higher than what we've seen. And then followed by the last horse, death. This is the Bible, not a fantasy. And it is first. What is first? What is first, Terry? The poison. Toxin. Well, have we had enough? <laughs> Solemn times, huh? I am asking God for leaders in our time, men and women who know how to lead, and I'm specific. So I'm going to stop there. We'll pick back up on more of that tomorrow, but a little bit different. But here's my point. Drew, do you mind coming back up? Could you do that, brother? Thank you. Um, so I believe, Drew, the Lord wants to do some healing. So just however the Lord leads you in that, brother, I... I'm asking the Lord for leaders. I'm asking the Lord for leaders like what we had in the beginning of this nation. Men and women of courage. Leaders in the governmental arena. Leaders in the economic arena. Leaders in the spiritual arena. And leaders in the military arena. All four. And I'm asking that they come together now. It's like a Beatles song. <laughs> Don't you think, Drew? <laughs> come together right now over me. Well, that'd be over Jesus, wouldn't it, brother? <laughs> C 
Come together. Come together. I'm asking for the Lord for leaders to come together, to find one another. I'm asking for men and women of courage who are meant by God to be governmental leaders. We need them. That's not my role, and I'm glad it's not. I'm asking for those to come together with those governmental leaders who are economic leaders to back the plans of the Lord, to take back his republic. I'm asking for leaders to come forth. Spiritual leaders who knows the time and knows what needs to be done and what needs to be said. Who can give the Lord's, the words of the Lord, the Lord's word to those governmental leaders, to those economic leaders, and to the military leaders. That four-fold combination Lord, we need that now. This nation, my friends, is not meant to come under the hands of the Antichrist. It was meant to be a refuge nation, not a part of the new world order, but a refuge nation. That'll really get you kicked off YouTube. Not a part of the new world order. Do you believe that? That's weak. Do you really believe that? Are we, what are we gonna do, sit on our butts and allow the new world order to take over? The word of the Lord is take back your homeland. That is the word of the Lord. And I'm not just saying it, just to be saying it. But we need the right leaders, don't we? And I'm not the governmental leader and I'm certainly not the military leader and aren't you glad? I'd be looking for the nuke button and where people live. <laughs> Say goodbye. Your time is up. Repent. You got 15 minutes to do it. <laughs> Sorry. Aren't you glad I'm not in control of the nukes? <laughs> that great reset would be a real reset. <laughs> I'll reset you. <laughs> Sorry. You know, anyway, whatever. My friends, they would have us believe, just go with the flow. Just take the poison. Don't create waves. This is just a little thing. It doesn't really matter. It matters. Allegiance matters. Allegiance is worship. Allegiance is worship. Let me say it one more time. Allegiance is worship. What we look to as source is what we worship. What we look to and trust in is worship. We may not bow down to an idol, but we may give in to fear, to fear of going hungry, to a fear of getting some unknown disease, but this will stop it, though it doesn't stop it. This thing will make it all better. Where in the world is Jesus gone? I think we've forgotten. There was a day when people had to trust the Lord. Before the early 1900s, modern medicine didn't exist. We think now that, oh, that's the way it is. No, it's the way it's become. I believe the Lord desires in our time to arise as the healer again among his people. I believe in Malachi 3 and 4 that he shall arise with healing in his wings. I believe that with my whole heart. Don't you, brother? I believe it. I believe we're going to need him, don't you? We're going to need him as our healer. So I want you to stand on your feet for a second. Now we're gonna start here tonight. Here's what the Lord told me. Tonight he said he wants to heal the ears. Tomorrow night he wants to heal, heal our feet. So if you've got problems with your feet tonight, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Josiah will carry you. <laughs> no, he and Isaac, no. 
No, it's a divine order to it. There's reasons why I'm saying this. But tonight, if you have problems with hearing, your ears are losing the ability to hear. I'm not, I saw something, uh, at least for one person in the room, it's somewhere around 45, 47% hearing loss in one of the ears. So if you have problems with hearing, I want you to put your hand up right now. Yeah. So keep your hand up there for a second. There's a number of people. So the Lord's the healer. Here's what we're not going to do, because the Lord's the healer, not me, right? Not anybody in this room. Not he can't use us, but the Lord's the healer. He's going to reestablish that fact that he's the healer. Keep your hands up for a second. So now, Lord, heal the ears. Restore hearing. to the ears. You created the ear. And you certainly hear, Lord, without ears. Give perfect hearing to right and left ears now, we ask. Perfect hearing. Reverse, for some, what has been slow deterioration for others, an accident, but reverse it and bring full hearing now, I ask. In the name of Jesus. Now, in keeping with this, now let's switch gears to a trained ear to hear the voice of the Lord. They would anoint the right ear, right, of the priest. We're demanded to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So I want you to put your hand on your right ear. That's the ear they would anoint. Now, God, I'm asking you to train my ear to your voice unlike ever before. Amen? I'm asking you to train my ear to hear you above the chaos, above the noise, above the clamor, above all, Lord, that is going on around us. Train our ear. Train our ear day by day by day by day. Train our ear. Lead us into the scriptures. Lead us into the quiet times. Lead us, Lord, and train our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I refuse, Lord, to believe, because it's not your will, that we would be deaf in such a time as this. Instead, Lord, the world may be deaf, but not your people called by your name healing now where there's 50% hearing loss now Lord reverse that completely and heal where there's 45% hearing loss reverse that and bring healing for some reason I'm, I'm picking on the right ear for a moment the right ear where there's 50% hearing loss, reverse that now in the name of Jesus. 45% hearing loss, 47% hearing loss, reverse that now in the name of Jesus. And let the sign of the right ear being healed be the sign of the right ear opened to hear the voice of the Lord, anointed to be trained and to hear the voice of the Lord unlike any other time in our entire life. And for us who already that is true, but yet what I'm asking, we're asking, all of us, yes, Lord, and even more. Above the din, above the family, above the voices of so-called authority, and above the voices of the so-called professionals. What does that mean? You got a degree in stupidity? Sorry. I don't really mean that the way it came out. It just came out that way, Bryce. But anyway, the degree you have to have in hearing the Lord is not a natural degree. It is a training to his voice. It is a submission. It is a surrendering. It is a willingness to hear. Let me not be stubborn. Stubbornness will cause me to lose his voice. Self-will will cause me to lose his voice. Wanting my way versus his way will cause me to lose his voice. I choose the voice of the Lord. I choose to hear. I pray for marriages, husband and wives, to hear, both hear, what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
for husband and wives, fathers and mothers to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, for grandparents to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, for the young people to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, for us old people to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, your people called by your name, hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. I pray for this specific body here. I pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I want to say that again. I knew I was to say this before I ever came here. I pray for the unity that's of the Spirit of God. The spiritual unity versus arguments, versus disagreements, versus doctrines versus attitudes, versus everything. Unity that's of the Spirit of God in the one life of Christ, that unity of the Spirit. And of the mind of Christ, that unity of the Spirit. That this mind be in us which is also in Christ Jesus. And the bond of the Prince of Peace, himself at peace with the Lord not at war because if we're at war with the Lord personally we'll be at war with one another but the prince of peace peace with him not pride peace not arrogance peace not knowing it all, peace. Not difficult, being difficult, peace. Not finger pointing, not accusing, not backbiting, not slandering, peace. And by the way, if I just described you, would you put up your hand? No, I'm just I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I had to have that humor in there then. <laughs> Well, Satan just ran out of the room, so I went answer. <laughs> Peace. I ask again, unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, guys, I was going to preach a different message, but it was so harsh I thought I wouldn't get an offering. I told my son-in-law and sons, I said, it's, it's going to be a bad offering night. <laughs> <laughs> I could care less about the offering, seriously. Don't come for the offering, but by the way, how much are you going to give? No, no. Uh, I could care less. Anyway. That's my sick humor. Yeah, sick, it? yeah thanks, Terry. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of offering, we are going to take up an offering, so uh, let's go ahead and have the ushers come up. And w the one thought I had was, okay, a lot. I would assume most of us here don't believe in the prosperity gospel, but... Um, can we give generously after hearing a message like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, that, I, I think that's an awesome challenge for us. Can someone get up and freely preach the breaking of the seals in the book of Revelation and the trouble that's coming and have a people that will still give generously? Amen. So my heart is that we would really give generously uh, over this weekend. I, I really want to bless Terry and Josiah with a very generous offering. That's in my heart, is that, is that we would really bless them. And so if you want to write a check, you can make a check out to Restoration Life. If you want to give online, you can give on uh, give.restorationlife.org. Even those watching online, I, I just encourage those watching online to make a donation. Every penny is going to go to Terry and Josiah. We're not taking any money. But I really do want to bless them. I, I want us to be able to get to this place where we can say, okay, so many preachers today are not going to preach that kind of message because of that one thing, a fear of offering or fear of losing people. Can we reverse that trend and say, preach whatever the Lord is telling you to preach, and we're going to give generously to bless you and honor you. So anyway, let's go ahead. I want to pray over the offering, and then we'll take up the offering. So Father, we just ask you right now, Lord, that you would richly honor Terry and Josiah for their ministry. 
Lord, for speaking the truth and love. And uh, I pray, Father, that we would give generously, Lord, that you would anoint us to give generously to bless and honor them, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. So go ahead and you guys take up the offering. Um, if you're watching online and you, and you want to give, there's also in the descriptions and the YouTube, if we're still on YouTube, I'm not sure. Uh, if we're still on YouTube, in the description, there's a link you can click that's uh, give.restorationlife.org, Facebook as well. If we're still on Facebook. Uh, there should be a link there, but just uh, give online uh, and we will uh, just really want to bless them. So really, truly, um, I'm grateful for that message. I know it's you know, not like your best life now, but it's the truth. It is the truth. I would much rather hear the truth. I, I'm sure if you're here, you want to hear the truth rather than your best life now, but I'm so thankful for that. Um, we're going to meet back here tomorrow at 10 in the morning, so I want to invite you back. And uh, I just believe God is going to do an incredible work. Uh, I think what Terry said is so true. He wants to do a deep, deep work. And the times we live in really demand that deep work. And so I be I'm believing God to just do a really deep work over these three days. Amen. So God bless you. Have an awesome night. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m.